When the micronova occurs, it will happen as a flash, a great flash. This is uh, for, for those who look in history, uh, geologic evidence, burned rocks, to even things like prophecy, and they talk about the great solar flash. That's the moment of the micronova. And it will be bright enough to burn. But that will not last terribly long. Then it's going to be basically this expanding nova shell that is coming towards the Earth. That will be one heck of a sight to see. Probably arrive about 18 to 24 hours after it erupts. When it hits the planet at that level solar storm, if we haven't already been thrown back to the Stone Age, you know, all the power grids down, at that point it happens, right? Because uh, we're talking about the biggest solar blast imaginable at this point. But this is also what causes the planet to turn over 90 degrees. And the reason is because it unlocks the crust, and the crust already, right now, today, yesterday, last year, wants to turn 90 degrees. The crust, if it was conscious, it could tell you, I don't want to be like this. I want to turn 90 degrees now. Now. Give it to me now. Why? When you, ever, when you have a, something that is spinning, any heavier part wants to spin at the point of greatest centrifugal force. This is actually a fairly basic physics principle. But at a spinning object, that's the equator. So where is the weight distribution off on our planet? It's the ice at the polar regions, right? Right. That wants to be at the equator right now, exactly 90 degrees from where it was. But we have to back up a step, don't we? Because why does the crust become unlocked by the micronova? Right. We were mentioning earlier how it's not a line of sight, it's induction when it comes to the solar storm risk. And that's why just putting something under the ground won't be enough. During modern day, run-of-the-mill small solar storms, we can detect that induced electric current getting all the way down into the mantle. But the area in between the crust and the mantle is where the crust is locked. It's called the low-velocity zone, and it's this thin layer. It's not like we have solids sitting on, you know, a lava lake below. Where they meet, there's a partial melted layer kind of like slow moving or cooling molasses. You know, it's, is it a liquid? Is it more solid? It's, it's, it's sort of in between, but it acts like a glue as molasses kind of does, locking them together. Well, if modern day puny solar storms can get that current all the way to the mantle, what happens to that layer during the biggest of all solar storms? The amount of energy surged through the low-velocity zone takes that partially melted glue layer and completely melts it. That unlocks the crust, and all of a sudden, the ice caps are free to yank the planet like this. And it's not the whole planet. There are some catastrophists nowadays who think it's everything all the way down to the core that is turning. It's not the worst idea I've ever heard. I prefer this version. Because, I mean, I, I can actually do the math. I can actually wrap my head around the crust being unlocked and the crust moving in that way. The ice caps just dragging the crust to where it wants to go. And so, from a scientific perspective, this is just using mainstream space weather science and solar storm and induction science, but it's taking it to an extreme level that most scientists never take it to because they don't have this, they don't have the micronova tool in their toolbox to play with. You know, when you add that tool, you're like, okay, I'm just going to use the same equations, same physics principles, just apply it to this event instead. The low velocity zone completely melts, the crust is unlocked, and we get the shifting 90 degrees to put the ice where it wants to be. And then, you know, several thousand years later, more new ice has accumulated at the polar region so that when it happens again, it can tilt 90 degrees once again. Now, 
What is what is the force that's keeping the 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 core and the center of the Earth up upright and in place as the crust turns ninety degrees? I don't necessarily know that there's a force keeping it in place. It's that the force yanking on the crust doesn't have a way to impact the core. So, um, so it's just that and loose. It just becomes that yeah. and loose from the center that it that it just it's just sliding as if it's right. If, yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Got it. Um, now, some of the evidence for this is it's really critical. Some of it is still classified to this day, although we have a way around that. And some of it is hiding in plain sight right in front of our faces. So let's start with the first one. After World War II, what was America worried about? Russia coming over the top, right? They weren't worried about them flying over the Pacific. They weren't worried about them flying over Europe and come. They were worried about Russia going over the North Pole and attacking the Americas that way, right? So they launched Project Nanook. They sent Major Maynard E. White up to the Canadian Arctic, set up bases, learn how to operate up there, you know, negative 50, negative 60, the Jeeps, the airplanes. You have to have a little bit different procedure. But they also quickly figured out, hey, wait a minute, when, when you're flying... At regular latitudes, the North Pole is not moving very much from your perspective, and so navigation with a compass isn't challenging. When you're flying around the North Magnetic Pole, north is this way, then it's this way, then it's this way, and you you have to think of a new way to navigate. But in order to do that, first you had to fully understand the Magnetic Pole. This is in the late 1940s. And what they found was they sent a bunch of teams out to try to locate the exact spot of the Magnetic Pole, and they all came back and said, we found it. And they're like, well, wait a minute. We, we, we sent you. We, you were 10 miles this way. You're five miles this way. You know, what do you mean you all found it? And it turns out they found it at different depths, meaning that it was moving over time. And when they went and they did more, they found out they could trace the line of where it was moving. And then they started to dig down. And they dig through this very normal layer. It's very icy. You've got some polar fossils in there. And then they hit one of these disaster layers. And below that, it's tropical fossils. And then another disaster layer, polar. And then another disaster layer, tropical. This is still classified to this day as part of Project Nanook. However, Major Maynard E. White did us a favor and committed treason. He kept all of the documents not only from Project Nanook, but from the Pentagon meetings where he went, you know, and, and presented these things. And they even brought in the Rand Corporation, which is the, the government's secret science little lapdog. I think even still to this day, they, they, they still do a lot of that, although I don't know for sure. Um, and so he's got the Pentagon documents, he's got the Rand documents, and he's got the mission documents over months, years, time. And the final ones where they said, Here's what's happening. We get a magnetic pole shift, and the Earth tilts 90 degrees, putting the Arctic at the tropics, and that's why those tropical fossils are found there. Every other layer, back and forth and back and forth. We're going to have to keep this in mind for the cover-up for just a minute. There's evidence from Scandinavia they found this ancient forest that was buried under ice. They found that as the glaciers were melting. And they found that all of this forest appears to have been buried about 13 or 14,000 years ago. There's no tree rings. None. There is a place in the world where the trees grow and do not have tree rings, and that's at the equator. Because tree rings are seasons. It's the changing of the seasons and how much it grows, how much rain it gets, how much sun it gets. If there's no seasons, there's no tree rings. But Scandinavia is Norway, Sweden, and Finland. What do you mean there's no tree rings in the trees there from 13, 14,000 years ago? Only if it was at the equator. But the one that's right in front of our faces, the mammoths. The frozen mammoths. 
everybody's heard this story, right? They dug these perfectly frozen mammoths out of 20 or 30 feet of ice and snow. And what did they find? They had frozen so quickly, the food was undigested in their mouths and even their stomachs. They froze so quickly, chemical digestion stopped. And everybody asks the wrong question. And the wrong question is, how did the mammoths freeze so quickly? Now, sure, that's interesting, but that's not the right question. The right question is, what were they eating? Because we are 12,000 years into a hot interglacial cycle. These creatures were frozen in the glacial cycle. And after 12,000 years of heat, we had to dig them out of 20 or 30 feet of ice. What do you think was there in the glacial cycle? 50, 60 feet of ice? Certainly not the thousand pounds of vegetation that these things needed to eat every day. The only explanation, because when they were frozen, there's, there's nothing to eat there now. In the glacial cycle, when it was 20 degrees colder, there was nothing to eat up there, I assure you. Unless that part of the world wasn't at the top unless it was down near mid-latitudes or low-latitudes, and then it got thrust to the polar region, which froze the mammoths pretty instantly. Because otherwise, what were they eating? There's literally nothing to eat there now. It's 20, 30 feet of ice. So when it was 20 degrees colder in the glacial cycle, when these creatures froze, they could not have been there. They would not have been there. It's impossible. This comports with the trees in Scandinavia. This comports with what Major White brought back. And so as to not get charged with treason, he just handed the documents to his son, Ken, and said, you publish these, which he did in a book called World in Peril. And so taken together, all of these things, yep, that is actually from the book. Now, here's what's interesting. This graphic right here, is derived from the data from the Pentagon. Specifically, the group from the Office of Strategic Services. Have you ever heard of this? It morphed into the CIA. The CIA used to be the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services. And at this time, and by the way, they said that this 90-degree tilt happens in one day. It is a one-day disaster. Well, Just boom, snap. So, and I mean, you're going to need, the climate's going to be different, I guess. So in North America, in this situation, are, where, where will we be as it relates to the equator? So for those watching, they can do this. They can take a globe and, you know, be looking at the equator and have Greenland up here. Pull Greenland down to the equator. And then with just the littlest tilt to have India up top and South America at the bottom. And you'll find that basically North America just is in the Southern Hemisphere and everything's flip-flopped. So not quite like that, but if we take... Uh... Yeah, I won't... Ryan, I don't need to do this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so basically if you've got Greenland at the equator... Um... Yeah, it's, it's a little bit more if you could turn that whole thing clockwise slightly. I don't know if that's possible. Maybe the other direction from what you just did. And now pull down so Greenland is at the equator. That's pretty close. That's pretty darn close to what the Earth is going to look like after this tilt. Okay. Holy cow, that was a really good job. So basically... America in general is in the exact same spot, except Canada and Mexico have swapped climates. Florida and Maine have swapped climates. New Mexico and Montana have swapped climates. Places like Colorado, Pennsylvania, the I states, pretty much the exact same latitude, but in the Southern Hemisphere. You see what I'm saying? I do, yeah. yeah. And so, um, you know, you've got places in Canada that are very, far more favorable than they are now, but the further you get into Latin America, the worse. And I mean, that, that's some of the best places for life right now. There's a reason the rainforest is there. And I know people do kind of think of 
Latin America is being less developed, et cetera, et cetera. I think that what the development exodus out of Europe has done can't be really compared to what it's been like the last thousand or two thousand years where i mean how long did the inca the maya um the area was very favorable to life and it's like the more favorable to life it is now the worse it's going to be later the harsher it is now temperature wise the better it's going to be later so like people in northern canada or people in alaska yeah i know they don't get to live life the way we do you know they they have to plan they they shut things down for entire seasons no it's not going to be the case afterwards and so you suffer now you suffer later or you suffer a medium amount both times gotcha gotcha <laughs>